we got some that get up, you know, pull oh, yeah. services over every week. You know, some may be going to work. I know one yeah. man goes to check on a wife in a nursing home, so yeah. you, know, you understand that. Well, in, fact, in fact, they grace the door and says a whole lot of person with the community. That's right. That's right. At least they're there. That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> good morning this morning. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Well, Mike, good to meet you. God bless you, Mike. So you grew up in this area here? No, I'm from Buford all my life. Oh, I've been pastor you said that. for almost five years. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. You know Stephen Fountain down in Buford? I do. He's a good, good friend of mine. We're not real tight. Like, I don't know if he, he probably doesn't know who I am, but my wife worked at the First Baptist Preschool. Okay. And my uh, grandmother sings in their senior adult choir. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, is, he, he wasn't one. I was a youth pastor for 27 years. He wasn't one of mine, but he was close to mine. Okay. And so um, I remember when our pastor died, he came all the way down to Warner Rogers to go to the funeral. How about that? Stuff like that just sticks out. He just man. came to support us. Good man. And I'll never forget. Had him speak for me at conferences and things. He's yeah. a good guy. Good family, too. Yeah, we're friends on the line. I'll keep up with right. right. Not too far away from us there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Of course, his daddy's over in what? Wilder or somewhere over there. Yeah, over that direction. direction. Yeah. They changed the name of their church. Yeah. 1025 um, Church. I think their address is 1025, Hebrews 1025. Right. Oh, Pretty okay. cool name for a church. Let's understand God's blessing that word. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Number one question I get asked about airliners, where did the church get their name? Is that an airport? I wouldn't even know airplanes when that church was started. <laughs> I get asked that question more than anything else. <laughs> Good deal. Well, I, again, I'm not sure what time he said to start because we, I think we, we finished a little bit with the invitation. So we'll go ahead and pray and if folks come in, we'll try to get them caught up, all right? Awesome. Lord Jesus, you're good to us. God, thank you, Lord, as Brother Eric said, for what we've seen already. Lord, to see grown men humble themselves before a holy God and get in the altar and lay some burdens there. God, I thank you for the victories that have already been won. Thank you for the way that you spoke through our brother, through the musicians earlier. Lord, in our time together, uh, in this session and in the sessions and the services to follow. God, I pray that you really would make us men after your own heart. God, that we would man up. We wouldn't be spiritual wimps, but we'd do everything we can to represent you in a world that is lost without hope. So, Lord Jesus, strengthen us. We need your presence and we need your power. Apart from you, we know that we can do nothing. So, God, thank you for creating us as men. God, thank you for that. Help us to represent you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Well, my name is Mike Dura. I, I, am, I still consider myself new, the new pastor at Airline since just January. And one of our deacons, Brother Joe's here. He's the kind of deacon I said, if I could just clone him. Not that our other deacons are bad, but he's just he's a great model of what it means. And if you visit Airline and come through the side door, you'll get the most friendly usher there. And that's Brother Joe as well. Led a co-worker to Jesus this week. So when I say I wish I could clone him, you see what I'm talking about. This is a man who's doing it and ministering to people and taking his ministry in the church seriously. So what do you think of when you hear the phrase, man up? And that doesn't say a whole lot. I don't know why you chose to come here. They're great sessions, and I appreciate Brother Eric video on them so I can go back and watch the others. But, you know, quite frankly, a lot of times there are things we might want to say and things we might want to share, and I try to be mindful of that because our services are recorded and we're online. You don't always get to share as much personal stuff when you're, when you're online. But what do you think about when you hear the phrase, man up? What does that mean? Stepping forward. Stepping forward, good. Anything else? Accountability. Accountability, that's certainly a huge part of it. Stand for what you believe. Stand for what you believe. Integrity. Right. Believe what you believe. What's that? Integrity. Integrity, all of this. Getting out of your comfort zone. Getting out of your comfort zone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Courage. Courage. Yes, sir. Man, y'all, this is good. Y'all just keep going. I just listen to y'all. Y'all got it going on. Man up is a, I don't even know when this phrase came about, but I remember hearing it, you know, and I did a men's conference for, for pastors in Brazil and had to kind of explain a little bit what man up was because you don't know which, what translation goes where. But, you know, we live in a world, in a, I, I say in America, but not just America, where now we have gender fluid roles. Have y'all heard that nonsense? Yeah. Did you hear that Prince Harry and Princess Meghan are going to not raise their children to be boys or girls, but going to let them decide? That's, that is insane. That is insanity. God blessed us. We have one of each. 
And I didn't have to teach my little boy how to be a little boy and want to play with trucks and balls and things. I didn't have to teach my little girl and want to play with baby dolls and be a little girl. That is the way that God created them. And I think it's child abuse to do to do otherwise. But again, I didn't have to, to teach them to do that, but we just fueled that so that my boy would be a man of God and my daughter, I pray, would be a young woman of God. Um, a real man is a lot of things. You guys just talked about a lot of them. And, and can I just tell you, I apologize if I'm a little distracted today. You know, I woke up this morning with two text messages from one of my dearest friends. I was blessed to, uh, to baptize he and his wife some time ago. And he just, the text message I got was, she said, it's over. She wants a divorce. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to get my buddy on the phone all morning long. Can't get him on the phone. Can't get him on text. So if I seem distracted, that is, that is why. My heart hurts for my brother, but for the grace of God, I'd be there. But for the grace of God, that'd be me and that'd be you. And by God's grace, we celebrated our 30th anniversary uh, last summer. So we got, we got a ways to go, but I'm very thankful that God gave me a wife. I don't know about you, Brother Josh, but God's pity on preachers. He lets yes, most sir. of us marry way over our head. He lets most of us have fun, our coverage. God feels sorry for us. I want to read you a, a quote from my, um, from my quiet time yesterday morning from Jonathan Kahn. He says, When a civilization redefines its values, when it changes the meanings and definitions of reality away from God, thinking about what it means to be a man this morning, when it alters the measures of morality to conform to its will and desires, it's dealing in false measures. It's turning the objective into the subjective and man into God. Never change the truth to fit your will. Amen. Change your will to fit the truth. God's unchanging truth. That which is true for all people, for all places, and for all times. We ain't got to pray about it. We ain't got to vote on it. Yeah. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember the battle for the Bible in our Southern Baptist Convention years sure. ago. And there were t-shirts and bumper stickers that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I didn't buy one of those because that's inaccurate. That's right, right. God said it and that that's settles it whether you and I believe it or not. Amen. Turning the objective into the subjective and man into God. Never change the truth to fit your will. Change your will to fit the truth. Never bend the Word of God to fit your life. Bend your life to fit the Amen. Word of God. God's Word has got to be our standard for everything, yes. specifically today for being a man. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 says this, What sorrow what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. And listen, we're not just talking about New York liberals. We're talking about in our own churches. Right. As a student pastor for 27 years, I would tell you one of the most godly young ladies, and I'm trying to be generic because we're being recorded, but one of the most godly young ladies I ever had as a youth pastor. Went on just about every mission trip with me. I would have told you she could be the next Lottie Moon. She went to Truett McConnell University where I've been affiliated since 2004 and was getting a degree in missions. One of the biggest shocks of my life was to hear she was getting married to a woman. She grew up in my student ministry. Her parents, her dad is a leader in our church. Nobody is exempt. Another sharp young lady raised in a godly home. Her parents homeschooled her. They did her best to protect her. She got married to a young man from Texas. I think he's from Texas. and They moved back out there. She has a GoFundMe page to raise money to help pay for her surgery to turn her into a man. Mm -hmm. I got news for her, and I got news for the world. It don't matter what kind of surgery and pills you take. You are who you are because God made you that way. She's still married to that dude. Does that make him a homosexual? I don't even understand all that crazy stuff. That's the world we live in. It's time to, to man up, and it's so good to see Joe having his son here with him today, raising up the next generation to be godly young men. Amen. A friend of mine who preached for me, Christian Newsom, several years ago, was trying to teach his little boy what it means to be a man. If you ever heard Christian Newsom, he's a church planter out in Kansas City, an awesome guy. And he said he got his little boy up one morning to teach him how to be a man. And so he, he took him and you know, taught him how to fake shave, you know, and showered him and wrapped that towel around him and you know, popped him with the towel, all the stuff, just showing his boy how to be a man. He said, then I was wrestling my boy. We were wrestling on the bed. You know, as a dad, I used to enjoy wrestling my boy until he could pin me down and beat me. Then it wasn't fun anymore. My boy's bigger than I am. You know? I remember again as a student pastor a long time ago, I can remember the specific moment when God said, you're just too old. 
I'm still in Lynchburg, Virginia as a youth pastor. And have you ever been a student pastor before? I have. Any of you guys have been a student? If you know when the student pastor gets in the water, the goal is drown that sucker. Everyone is going to jump on you and wrestle him. I'm in Smith Mountain Lake and... Um, I forget what city in Virginia where Smith Mountain Lake is. And all those boys jumped on me and I couldn't fight them off anymore. I was just in my 30s then. I'm 55 now. I thought, I can't keep doing this. But Christian was teaching his boy how to be a man. You know, They're wrestling on the bed. And Christian said, I just laid there and I played dead. I just laid still. I thought, what's my boy going to do? Is he going to get upset? Is he going to think he killed his daddy? He says, I just laid still. And he said, my boy was still. He wasn't moving. He, I thought he was going to be upset and check on me. He said, I just laid there and the next thing I felt was like wet stuff all over my back. And he said, the boy took off the towel and put on the cape like Superman and stood there and just peed all over his neck. <laughs> stuff sometimes is men. I hate talking about keeping your aim this morning. Some people are male in gender, but they've never really grown up to be a man. You're right. You're right. You know, this whole thing of adolescence, you know that's a that's a made up phenomenon, right? You're right. You know, in biblical times you were a child and then you were a man. You know, Mary and Joseph were probably middle schoolers. I don't advocate middle schoolers getting married in this culture, but we've invented this whole thing and we called it adolescence. You know, you can trace it back to the Industrial Revolution and child labor laws, not that those were bad. And we've created this limbo land. And we say in America, now you're supposed to be crazy. You're supposed to lose your mind because you're hormonal, and they are, on, and the yes, hormones sir. are racing through. Does God have different standards or not? No, sir, right. It doesn't matter what age you are. The standard of God is the same. I don't yeah. see in Scripture a period where it's okay to lose your mind. We don't have any teenagers here today, but some of you have teenagers. Some people are male and gender, but they've not ever grown up. Hebrews 11.24, the hall of faith, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, when he'd grown up, and I don't have time to dissect that passage, but I'm tempted to. It says, when he'd grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, he was uh, the prince of Egypt. You've seen the cartoon movie, right? He was the prince. He had all of that entitled to him. But the Bible says he chose to suffer with the people of God. Then it goes on to say how he reinstituted the Passover. He brought the people back to the standard. So being a man, by faith Moses, when he'd grown up, being a man is even, even more than just, I mean, you're, you're male by gender, you're male by the way God created you, but to man up and to be a man of God, it requires more than that. And it's not defined by how many birthdays you've had. It's not defined by whether you stand up or sit down when you go to the restroom. Being a man is defined by God's Word. Amen. Look at 1, Corinth, excuse me, 1 Kings chapter number 2, if you have your Bible. or you know, The old preachers used to say, I love to hear the sound of God's pages turning. Now we say, I love to see the glow in your faces when you open up your electronic <laughs> devices and look at the Word of God. 1 Kings chapter 2, this is Solomon, wisest man who ever lived, talking to his son David in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I'm going, I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go to die. Take courage and be a man. And if he had any doubt about that, he says in verse 3, here's how you do it. You observe the requirements of the Lord your God, follow all His ways. You know, I like going to Piccadilly Cafeteria. We don't have one of those up here. Uh, or s, s Cafeteria in Macon when I lived in middle Georgia. But we do have Rabbit Town. And I walk through Rabbit Town, I look at food that I like, and I want, and I look at like cooked greens. Anything tastes that bad is not going to cross my lips. If it smells that bad, I can't get it across my lips. I pick what I want and I leave what I don't want. Serving the Lord is not a cafeteria line. He said, observe and follow all His ways. Keep the decrees, <laughs> commands, and regulations and laws written in the law of Moses. Why? So that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. Amen. Man, the greatest thing we can do is pass that on to our sons. I couldn't wait until my boy was old enough to comprehend. I heard a preacher say it years ago, and I wanted my boy to be old enough, and some of my sweetest times as a dad was going to my boy's room every night, and we'd read the proverb of the day. 31 of them. Some months have 31 days, and we'd read the proverb of the day and pray together. The only wisdom I can give my son is from the Word of God. Well, what does it mean to man up? Number one, one of my mottos is I can read, but I can't remember, so I'll write it down. I put a little outline in your chair when you came in if you've got something to, to write with. And 
The research says if you throw this in the trash can and you never look at it again, the fact that you wrote it down, you're more likely to remember it. And I talk fast. So you can write it down and go back and see later on, did I tell you the truth or not? Number one, real men love Jesus above all others. Real men love Jesus above all others. I love the old song by Stephen Curtis Chapman, Magnificent Obsession. Jesus is to be my magnificent obsession. I'm to love Jesus more than anything or anybody, including my wife. And I'm telling you, God blessed me. I got the greatest wife. She's put up with me for 30 years and counting. She grew up at the great First Baptist Church of downtown Jacksonville, Florida with Homer Lindsay Jr. and Jerry Vines were her pastors. And I'm the only man my wife's ever kissed. I'm telling you, I am one blessed dude. She still, man, she can walk in the room and it still lights my fire. And as a student pastor, I would say this because it was the truth. And I know many kids don't have a daddy that loves their mama. I come from a broken home. My parents divorced when I was in middle school. If my wife was ever dealing with a young lady or something and she walked in late, I'd say, y'all, the most beautiful woman I've ever seen just walked into the room. I meant it, and I wanted my boys to know that's the way you're supposed to love and honor your wife. But listen, I can't be the husband to her that I ought to be if she's number one in my life. Yes, sir. Jesus has got to be number one in my life. Men are driven to be successful. I mean, nobody wants to lose. My kids played upward basketball at our church, Second Baptist, and one Robin's upward basketball, and then we added other sports. Any of your kids play that? Or, you know, it's a great ministry. It's just, you know, in the 70s, churches grew with having bus ministries. We reached a lot of people through bus ministry. I would say sports is the bus ministry of today. I saw a man who was on the verge of divorce, about to leave his wife, had trouble with alcohol, came to watch his little boy play upward basketball. And if you know anything about that ministry, at halftime, somebody shared their testimony and their faith. And I saw Jim Dutcher give his life to Jesus at halftime, about to leave his wife. Fast forward all these years later, Jim Dutcher leads that ministry of open basketball at Second Baptist Church today. So ball is a tool, but my son, whew, I used to say my wife's the most competitive human being I've ever met, and she was until she gave birth to my son. And he's far more competitive than she is. And he said, Daddy, my kids will never play upward. I said, why, son? It's a great ministry. He said, because there's no winners or losers. They don't keep score. Well, that's not real life. In real life, you don't get every promotion. You don't get every raise. But we're driven to win. If you want to win as a man of God, let's follow the Word of God. And David said to Solomon, here's how you do it. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God. Follow all His ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses. Why? So you'll be successful in all you do wherever you go. How do you know if a man loves his wife? Y'all talk to me while I take a drink of water. How do you know a man loves his wife? Takes care of us. Takes care of her. He sacrifices for her. Is that it? Provides and protects. Provides and protects. He probably has to love the Lord. He can't love his wife right if he don't love the Lord first. You're abs I mean, you can have some emotions and some goosebumps that feel good for a while. But the reality is, I got the greatest wife anywhere, but I found out after we got married, she don't do everything like I do. And I don't do everything like she does. And nobody can bring greater joy to my life as a human being than my wife. And let's just be real. Nobody can make me tempted to be mad as quick as my wife. Am I telling the truth about that? You know, the Bible says all of sin that falls short of the glory of God. And here's some mathematics for you. One sinner plus one sinner, that equals double trouble. Yes, and if Jesus is not the Lord of my home, we're headed for disaster. We're headed for trouble. So we, we work through those things. You know that a man loves his wife because he provides for her. He protects her. He speaks highly of her. Um... Again, we're being recorded, so I've got to be careful. But when you hear somebody always put down their spouse, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. my word. Yes, sir. Yeah. Listen, I'm not perfect and my wife's not perfect, but I don't go te telling everybody her faults and I hope she don't go telling everybody mm -hmm. my faults. She is my number one person that I need. Maybe I can't right. be the pastor that I am without the benefit of my wife. How do you know that a man loves his kids? He spends time with them. I mean, in this whole thing of... um. Quality time versus quantity time. 
Where'd that hogwash come from? I mean, that's not in the Bible anyway. Or quality time versus quantity time. I think I get that. You know, when you're with your kids, are you with your kids? Yeah. Are you with your kids and you're watching TV or some video game? I mean, I'm blessed. I'm so ADD. There's no way I could sit down and play a video game and concentrate that long. So I'm not tempted by that. But it may be sports. And I'm blessed, thank God, my wife's as big a dog fan as I am. And my son, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't watch football with other people. Can I just tell you that? Right. We don't go to football parties. You know why? Because folks talk to you. And they want a fellowship. I don't want a fellowship when the dogs are on. And my wife gets that and my kids get that. Right. One time, this is, this is a guy. One time I let my son have a friend over. His parents were out of town and he spent the night with us. And he's a quiet kid. That dude talked the whole time. <laughs> And here's why. He was a tech fan. Probably dropped on his head as a child. I mean, just that during that ball game. But listen, if you walked into my office at Airline Baptist Church and you had never met me, all you did is walk into my office, you could probably quickly deduce some things about me. Hope you'd see that I love the Lord by the things that you see there. Hope you'd see that I love my family because I got their pictures all over the walls. And you would sure enough see that I love the Georgia Bulldogs because I got Georgia stuff all over the place. Hey, I met my wife at the University of Georgia. That's reason enough to love it right there. You know that somebody loves someone or something by their time and by their checkbook. Yeah. Now, we don't carry checkbooks anymore. Sometimes you have to explain to people what that is. Yeah. Only checks I write are to my church, and I could do that online, but it's just it's like my last holdout. It's the only checks I write is to the church, you know, and I just, I guess I'm old fogey. I like putting it in a plate kind of as an act of worship, but Clint Fair, my associate pastor, says he can worship when he just hits that button and does push pay. But by the way, you spend your money, and by the way, you spend your time. Right. That says a lot about your affections and what you love. Amen. Listen, I'm here today. I'm honored to be here today. But you know what? I can't wait to get home to my wife. Because as a pastor, you know, we're drawn in a thousand different oh, directions. Yeah. Up late at night. Saturday is her day. If she wants to go to Belks, <laughs> I'll go to Belks. Thank God for an iPhone. What do we do before that so I can entertain myself? If she, you know, we go visit her aunt. Her aunt never had children. She's in her 80s, and we moved her to Gainesville, and we go sit with her at Autumn Breeze. I'll be going by there this afternoon. Whatever she wants to do, that's her day. When we lived in Lynchburg, Virginia, I took Mondays off and whatever she wanted to do. And back then, there was nothing. Jerry Falwell used to say except Liberty University and a fleet enema factory. That's all that was in Lynchburg. <laughs> so on Mondays, we drove to Roanoke to the mall. And there, we didn't even have a, a Walmart back then. But if you've been to Lynchburg since then, it's changed. Your time and your money. If the President of the United States asked to meet with you, I don't care if it's Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, or whoever. And I could comment on all that, but I'll refrain from that. You know, they say there's two things you ought not to talk about. Politics and religion. My undergraduate degree is political science. I wanted to be the governor of Georgia as a little boy. My master's degree is religion. It's any wonder I'm not in jail today. The two things you're not supposed to talk about. But if the President of the United States asked to meet with you, you would make that a priority. If, if Senator Isaacson or Senator Perdue, our two Georgia senators, if they asked to meet with you, you would make that a priority and you would prepare yourself ahead of time. If I'm going to love Jesus above all others, and I'm very honored that Eric asked me to come today, but listen, if I got to speak in Mercedes-Benz Stadium tonight to thousands of people, that ain't the most important thing I did today. The most important thing I did today was my time 2722 Summer Creek Drive in South Hall County, just me and King Jesus. Yes, sir. Because I'm not fit to talk to you if I hadn't talked to him. I'm not fit to speak to you about the Word of God if I've not had my personal time in the Word of God. And it's not preparing for a sermon. It's not preparing to teach a lesson. It's just hearing from the Lord. And it takes work. It takes work. Paul writing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, train yourself to be godly. Your translation may say, discipline yourself to be godly. And just the very word discipline says effort to me. And it says work. Yes. When it says train yourself to be godly, that word in verse 7 comes from the Greek word gumnos. You know what that word means? It means naked. It's the same word we get gymnasium and train from. Why does a gym smell like it does when a bunch of guys have been in there? Working out, playing basketball or whatever. Why does it smell that way? Sweat. Sweat. He said,
says we ought to sweat to be godly. We ought to work to be godly. Discipline yourself. How much spiritual sweat do we invest? Listen, I've been in a free fall physically. I've had asthma and allergies. I just finished my third round of antibiotics. Y'all pray for my wife. I'm not antibiotics. Prednisone. Oh. Steroids. If you've ever taken that stuff, I'm driving her slap crazy. Three doses of that. Asthma inhalers. Breathing treatment. If you're taking steroids, you know it makes you want to eat the whole house. Yes, yes. I hadn't had breath enough to go to the gym like I ought to, so it just doesn't take long. Those pounds start coming right back here. If I'll choose to work out physically, if you choose to work out physically, why in the world would I not be willing to invest more time to work out <coughs> spiritually? Paul is saying to young Timothy, if you love Jesus, you've got to put in some spiritual sweat. If there's no discipline, there's no discipleship. I told you that word meant naked. In the ancient Greek athletic competitions, men competed with no clothes to have no encumbrance, nothing to hold them back. And I think of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. It says, therefore, referring back to chapter 11, the hall of faith, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these are the saints in heaven, I believe they're cheering us on. He says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin. Now I'm from South Georgia, and I don't always speak good grammar, but I had some good English teachers in high school and at UGA. And I remember the, that's a definite article, not an indefinite article. He doesn't just say sin, but he says the sin. I believe every man, every person has a besetting sin. Sure. Something that we struggle with more than other sins. And quite frankly, for most of us men, it's the same thing if we're honest about that. What is the sin? Strip off the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance. Strip off anything that holds you back. Now, I'll be honest. If folks competed naked, I wouldn't be going to Planet Fitness. I'd be working out at my own house. But in the ancient <laughs> culture, that's what they did. We've got to direct all of our energy and our sweat to being men of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says, All athletes are disciplined in their training. Well, sometimes I watch the Braves and wonder, but they're supposed to be disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. This is right. I mean, I was the asthmatic. My dad was a great athlete. I'm the asthmatic. My son is a great athlete. My dad used to say, it just skipped right over you to John Michael. He had all these trophies. He played every sport as a little guy. Had trophies in those. But you know what? When he got married and moved in with his wife, a lot of those went to Goodwill. I mean anything. Just like he's talking about here. He says, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete in training to, for it to do what it should. It's discipline. All athletes have to be disciplined. We live in a culture where kids will discipline themselves for homework, and thank God I'm not in school today. They got more homework than we ever did before. They discipline themselves to make good grades, to get in the college they want to. We discipline ourselves for sport. I was in the band. My, my goal, one of my goals was to be in the University of Georgia Red Coat Band. I worked hard to do that. I was in it for two weeks. And I said, them people are serious musicians. I just wanted to have fun. But I disciplined. I memorized seven chromatically adjacent scales. I can't tell you what that is today. I don't even know what that means today. If we discipline ourselves for music, for sports, for athletics, and so as parents, we do that. We want our kids to be successful in those areas. But when your child has to say Saturday night, Daddy, are we going to church tomorrow? You're in trouble. You're right. Mark it down. You you're are really in good. trouble if your kids right. have to ask that. If we discipline ourselves for everything else but not godliness. And it's the discipline of prayer and a quiet time. Yeah. I'll be honest. Reading my Bible is not as much of a struggle for me. But the hardest thing I do every day is prayer. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I guess because my brain is always firing in a thousand directions. But to be still and know that I'm God, to be disciplined in my prayer life. So I have, I have it divided up in seven different days. Things I pray for on different days of the week. Some things I pray about every day. And then he says, we're to pray without ceasing. So we're always in an attitude of prayer. But I needed the discipline of having a, a prayer list every day to focus myself. And James says in James 5, 16, somebody said accountability earlier. And I wish I'd already printed this outline. If you want to just add another one under number one, real men are accountable with other men. 
I wish I'd put that on there. Real men are accountable with other men. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. The brother leading worship this morning said, We don't really do a good job of that as men, do we? Well, when I act like we got everything together, you know, women, they just emote. They just tell everything. If you don't believe it, look at daytime television sometimes, those talk shows. But men, we kind of hold it in because we're prideful. We struggle with our... We don't want anybody else to know that we struggle. Remember the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. You know this story. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Mm -hmm. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Dude was dead. Yeah. I'm talking dead as 4 o'clock in a government office. Don't tell my wife that short for a whole county. It's not true there. But he was dead. But David did something very curious next. He ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. How does that apply to us as men today? I think when we confess our sins before God, we've, we're killing it. We're killing it. But we want to make sure it's dead. We will be accountable with another man. I think that's how you cut that snake's head off. I confess my sins to God, but if there's other men in my life who can look me in the eye and I give them permission to ask me the hard questions, Mike, have you spent adequate time in Bible study and prayer this week? Have you been anywhere with a woman that you ought not to be this week? Have you shared the gospel with anybody? When you've got people, you give permission to share. I think that's like cutting off the head of that giant. The discipline of prayer and quiet time. Confessing your sins to one another. Holding each other accountable. Real men don't always express our feelings well. How would your marriage be if you never told your wife you loved her? How would your marriage be if you've never spent time with her, if you're not married and you have a girlfriend? How would that relationship be progressing if you're not spending time with her and expressing your emotion to her? You don't have very much of a relationship there. Heard about one old guy, he's from a different generation. He said, look, I told her when I married I loved her. Anything changes, I'll tell her different. <laughs> you know, we've got to keep on expressing that over and over. I think about Brother George McGuire. He was a charter member of Old Forest Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, where I served for seven years. If, he, if anybody had a reason to stay home, it was Brother George. He, he couldn't hear anything. But he didn't miss church. Brother George was there all the time. And every now and then our pastor would do this over and over again. Brother George, made it up. Brother, he's the preacher's talking to you, Brother George. Tell him that they've been married 70 years. He said, Brother George, what's the secret to a healthy marriage? He said the same thing every time. We'd laugh like we'd never heard it. He said, she goes her way, I go her way too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the reality is, we're to be the spiritual leaders, and as we lead our family spiritually, we want our wives and children to follow that example. Jesus said the greatest commandment, Mark 12, 30, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. Oh, yeah. Who I am in my soul, with my brain, the things that I allow into my brain, you know, that says something about my love for Jesus. I've got to be selective about what I allow to go in my brain. Listen, I may struggle to stand here and quote Scripture that I memorized years ago. But i tell you what I can do, and I ain't proud of it. I can quote just about every lyric to Leonard Skinner's Golden Platinum. I can quote...